What's up, guys? They broke up the Patreon family like we were the fucking Mansons. Been wanting to post this for like two years, but I've kept it on Patreon. It's a shoot interview I did with Pondo back in 2022. It was my first ever shoot interview, and you could tell because I'm nervous as shit, but check it out, guys. <laughs> It's an honor to have you on for real. It's no an honor to even deal. speak to you, bro, to be honest. No big deal. But uh, I was, I was doing some research and um I saw that you were you said that you got into wrestling, you were watching it with your great grandparents. Yeah. Like the WWF in your house. Who was your favorite wrestler back then? Uh back then, man. I mean, you gotta get was a, this was before the in your houses. This was USWA, oh, okay. which was CWA, which was the Memphis areas, Jerry the King Lawler, Bill Dundee, and shit like that. Oh yeah. And then um, there was wrestling at the Chase in St. Louis, but uh, probably back then I always loved the crazy guys, and oh. Bruce and Brody was one of them. Oh, uh, yeah. the okay. was one of them. The Moon Dogs was one of them. So yeah, man, I had a I had a bunch of favorites, but it was always the crazy guys and. And uh, look, who, here I am, Madman Pondo, you know. What do you think your great-grandparents would say if they saw fucking deathmatch wrestling, bro? <laughs> oh, man. I, you know, the USWA was famous for bleeding a lot. And oh, yeah? My, yeah. And my uh, grandparents loved every minute of that shit. So. Hell yeah. My so we're talking about my great grandparents, but my grandma, uh, and she, she loved that I loved what I was doing, but hated that uh, I would scar my body up. But my grandpa, he would come watch me do this shit, so yeah. they were all cool with it. Now, mom and dad, they uh, they would come to normal matches, but death matches they just couldn't sit through. They said so. Really. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm the only freak in the family, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and you, I also saw that you said um, that you would put on, no one would really watch the In Your House at, when you would put it on, and you said that you would throw a deathmatch tape in, and everyone in the room would be glued to the TV. I wanted to know, what, what matches would you put on? Like, what, what tapes would you put in so that everyone watched? I had a, I had a wing compilation, compilation oh, yeah. uh, Puerto Rico compilation, and uh, the, the main one was uh, the Masanaga versus Mr. Pogo 6-7 uh, matches on a videotape. And I wore that one out. I had to reorder that one, actually. Yep. And, this, and the, second one, the second one that I got was terrible quality, but I still watched it a lot. And now I'm on first-name basis with both those guys. So. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, Mr. Pogo, rest in peace. But uh, uh, just today, because uh, someone was fucking with me, I had to ask Mr. Masanaga. I was like, you did give me the American Danger Man name, right? And he wrote me back and he said, yes, most definitely. So uh, just confirming, you know, I, I didn't want to keep saying it if he didn't really say it, but he, he just confirmed that he really did say it. Plus, he gave me the, the arm gauntlets. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, think about that, man. The guy that you was watching to become re retarded like I am today is the one who said, "Take my name. Here's my arm gauntlets. Go with it." What kind of, what kind of big privilege is that for a, for a fan of of that kind of shit? You know, dude, it's amazing, bro. I bet it fucking, it's felt so awesome, bro. So what, every, time, in every time I go to his restaurant, he, he's focus in on me he's like oh pondo you know so okay. yeah he's no, the cook he had a restaurant that's awesome yeah he's the cook yeah. oh. i'm not i'm not just saying this and maybe i'm biased because he's the cook but he has a steak joint and it is the best steak that i have ever had i don't know what he's marinating that shit in but uh he, ha he has a regular steak, and then he has a garlic steak. And I actually got a hold of a garlic steak one time, and I was not a fucking fan. But the, 
the normal steak, beautiful, great. Do you have a favorite death match from Masanaga? From Masanaga? Yeah. Uh, I would have to say, because I was there, um, Masanaga took on Nightmare Freddy, Doug Gilbert, whatever you want to say, uh, in a lights out match, but I was there for it when awesome. Wing returned. Wing, Wing came back for one more show. And uh, I was at that Wing show, and I went backstage, and, and Mr. Pogo uh, uh, wanted to meet me, right? And, no uh, and uh, so I'm in the locker room, and Mr. Pogo was asking me if I'm exclusive to Big Japan. And at that time, I was like, yes, I am exclusive to Big Japan. So uh, for Onita's retirement match, well, one of his retirement matches, of course, he's not – retired uh i get uh i had an asian wife at the time and, oh, wow. yeah and uh big japan office called for both of us not just me they called for her too and i'm thinking what the fuck is this all about so we get to the office and uh tosaka the big japan boss is talking to my wife in Japanese and I can see her face is getting all excited. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? So she speaks English to me and says, um, do you want to work Onita's retirement match? I was like, uh, right. fuck yeah. I want to work Onita's retirement match. Yeah. And I said, what, what are we doing? Uh, exploding Bob wire. And she's like, well, no, you're not with Onita, he's wrestling Tenru and some other guys in a, in a tag. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, so what am I doing? And uh, she said, it'll be Ricky Fuji and Go Saka versus you and Mr. Pogo, Mr. Pogo's request. Dude, I damn near ran to the bathroom and jacked off. I couldn't fucking believe it. <laughs> so uh, then when I got there, I'm thinking – I'm the American, I'm the fall guy, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. the, I'm the one going down. Balls, but, uh, yeah. When I got there, no, Mr. Pogo, uh, uh, I pinned to go Saka and Mr. Pogo uh, put a rope around Ricky Fuji's neck and threw him over the top rope. And we were just going to town on these guys and I'm fucking, I'm fucking freaking out, man. But yeah, the, that, that was a pretty big thing for me. Not only am I on first name basis with Masanaga and uh, and Mr. Pogo, but Onita as well, which really impresses the shit out of me. And then when I was dating Sarah Logan, uh, she went over to Japan and she told Onita that she was my girlfriend and he brought her on stage during one of his uh, concerts and announced to everybody who she was and shit like that. So... Yeah, man. Uh, they say never meet your heroes. Fuck that. I met three of them, and they were fucking awesome to me. And when was this? Around the late nineties, about? What went? What, what are we talking about? The when you were over in Japan, because I know you were over there around the year two thousand with CZW, with Wife Beater and Zandig and them. Was that your first time over there? Yes, two thousand to two thousand and eight. And then I went back April two thousand seventeen for for one tour. Hell yeah. And I'm supposed awesome. to be, I'm, I was supposed to go back in 2019 and work Shadow WX uh, company, but right then is when COVID hit. I mean, Damn. three more days, the ticket was going to be bought. And then I got the, uh, I got the uh, big email, Pondo, so sorry, but uh, the airports are shut down and they're still shut down or I'd be over there right now. <laughs> After doing some research, I was looking, and I always thought back in the day, like in the early 2000s, I always thought CZW and IWA Mid-South were kind of like the only deathmatch companies. But after doing some research on you, I see that there's wrestling in Jasper, there was BBW, um, ICW, CAPW, and they had some death matches over there too. But what, what was the atmosphere like at those companies? Because I never really heard anything about them besides from what I've read so far. Well, pretty, mal, pretty much in that time, every company that I went to, they wasn't booking me to do headlocks and, and wrist locks. Yeah. So all of a sudden, that company would become a deathmatch company because they would hire me and Ian or yeah. me and a guy named Manslaughter. Uh, I know fuck Ian Rotten, though. I hate that motherfucker. 
I will oh, yeah. never say his name all that much. Um, uh, me and Two Tough Tony, you know, uh, wherever I went, it wasn't for my wrestling ability. It, it was for my my deathmatch yeah. style, which uh, which hurts me today. Not really hurts me, but uh, some promoters don't bring me in because they think, oh, yeah. Madman Pano can't wrestle. He can only do that deathmatch stuff. No, I was a wrestler before the deathmatch stuff, but the deathmatch stuff pays way better than the wrestling. So I'm going to go do deathmatches as much as I can. I have a question about that. So if you were to talk to somebody that wanted to do deathmatch wrestling today and they wanted to go to a wrestling school to learn, would you suggest that deathmatch wrestlers need any like more type of preparation or any more things to learn more than a wrestler? Or would you just tell them go to normal wrestling school and then do some death matches. Like, how does that work? It's it's funny you even saying this because there is uh, there's a lot of guys that come to me and say, "Hey, man, I want to do death matches," and then they'll say the words, "Can you teach me to do death matches?" Yeah. <laughs> there, there there is no teaching somebody to do death matches. Yes. You either have it in your heart or you don't have it in your heart. So. To, to ask somebody that, okay, I'm not telling anybody just to get in there and start doing death matches because that's just ridiculous. You know, you, you still have to go to schools. You still have to know uh, how to fall. You still need to know how to do a promo. You still need to know ring entrances. You still need to know body placement during matches. But uh, after you learn all that, if you do have the heart and the balls to do death matches, then by all means come to me and say, Hey man, I'd like to try one. Uh, I get this all the time that uh, guys will say, well, everybody says you're the safest death match worker. I want to get into death matches. Will you be my first death match? Yes. You know, why not? But um, it, it is difficult for, for somebody to come and say, Will you teach me to do death matches? Because two fucking street brawlers can do that. You know, you yeah. gotta learn the shit and then be a death match worker. Do you have any good stories of someone that wanted to do death matches and after you had a match with them, they were like, dude, I'm not doing that shit anymore. That was fucking way too crazy. Uh I don't know if I have a story like that, but I will give you the story. I was in uh I won't even say what town. I was in this town and um the promoter's son is a big fan of mine. So he wanted to tag team with me versus these two two uh, younger guys. And when I get there, I hear them both arguing, and it's just getting louder and louder. So finally, my partner, I asked him, I'm like, what are those guys fighting about? And they're like, oh, they're trying to figure out which one's going to do the job. Hmm. So I go over to them, and I say, guys, what's this fight about? And one of them saying, well, I brought this many people and, and, uh, I don't want to go down. I want him to go down. And the other one's like, well, you know, I got the sponsors and I brought this many people. And I said, guys, there's fucking 50, 65 people out there. How many people could you have possibly brought? Yeah. So I said, okay, here's the deal. You guys are going over me. One of you two are pinning me. And they're like, no, we're not supposed to pin you. I'm like, no, tonight, one of you guys are going to pin me. So uh, I go sit down, and I'm I'm uh, with my partner again. And next thing I know, they're fighting again. I go over, I say, what are you guys fighting about now? Which one was going to pin me? <laughs> Motherfuckers. I said, all right, you're pinning me. This guy right here, you're pinning me, right? And I said, I want you guys to listen what happens after you pin me okay so uh went out and got on the mic and told everybody there's no way that these two losers coming through this door is ever gonna beat me they might beat him but they ain't never gonna beat me and if they do beat me i will kiss everybody's ass on the way out of this building right? <laughs> so uh sure enough they beat me and uh i got up and got on the mic and and bitched about how fast the ref counted. Uh, I said I never lost a match in my life. This place is corrupt. And, and of course, the crowd is just fucking 
going nuts and and yelling heat and all this shit and i get in the back and them two guys were like dude that was the best heat that we've had in this building and i'm like yes and do you realize i went i took the pin but i'm still got the crowd right where i want them and they went to shake my hand and i said no i don't want you guys to shake my hand this time i want you to shake my hand next time this time is a learning experience when I come back, I'm not even going to shake your hands when I get to the building. After the match, I'm going to see if you guys learn what I tried to teach you, and then I'll shake your hand. But then that company never brought me back, so whatever. Damn. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> well, I was doing some more research. I saw that you won the MAW Hardcore Cup in 2000. That was your first deathmatch tournament win, right? Yeah. And and what a what a fun company that was, Carmine Despirito. Dude, uh, I have some MAW DVDs. That it was a nice company, man. They had some yeah. great matches. He always brought us in uh, the night before, and um, gave us a hotel. So all the boys, you know, we we all had good times, and yeah, uh, afterwards was always a big after party, and we always left the next morning. Um, the, the the locker room was cool. Uh, Ken Anderson was in there. Um, Bone Crusher, Skull Crusher, some shit. I don't know. Uh, Hardcore Craig. I mean, it was just a really yeah. fun locker room. And um, yeah, man. I, and then I won that tournament. How did it feel to finally win a deathmatch tournament? I mean... After a while, when you've been doing this so long, it doesn't matter, you know, yeah. win, lose. I, I just like, I just like being in front of the crowd, the crowd, uh, appreciating you, chanting your name and all types of stuff like that. I mean, and the payday at the end is nice too, but. Of course. And also I was doing some more research. I saw that you had a loser eats dog food match back in the day. How did that come about? I don't know. Who'd I have it with? Um, I need to look it up. Anderson, I'm pretty sure. Hold Ken on. Anderson? I, uh, let, let me go ahead and... Uh, I say Dan Anderson, but hold on one second. Oh, Dan Anderson. Dan Childers? I don't know, but anyway... Uh, here here's and, and then the dog Dan Anderson. Food. Yeah, it, it was Dan Anderson. I just and, and the dog food, uh, I wouldn't eat it, so it got rubbed all over me. I do remember that. But um here is the thing about okay, so back in the day, man, I used to go to wrestling hardcore. Can't tell you one match that I went and saw. I could tell you wrestlers that I saw. Um p very Pacific matches like uh i'll never forget my grandma brought me to the coliseum and we were late and i was so pissed off <laughs> but uh i couldn't hate because it was my grandma and she was buying my ticket right yeah. so we got inside and uh, what she would do is drop me off at the coliseum go do her shopping come back pick me up later uh we got in the evansville coliseum and we got to the uh, ticket booth and my grandma asked if there was any tickets left because this thing was sold the fuck out. Yeah. And the the ticket lady said, well, to tell you the truth, these people didn't come pick up their tickets. And if they're not here by now, we can, we can go ahead and sell their tickets. Mm -hmm. And my grandma said, okay, uh, she bought them front row middle for Jerry, the King Lawler versus Bill Dundee. Uh, uh, loser leave town match and i'm talking right. about the bleachers were full the top bleachers were full all the seats were full but i got because we were late i got a front row ticket in in the front row so um, oh yeah my grandma was awesome she took me to to ozzy osbourne concert to Dawkin, to to uh i'll tell you how cool my grandma is one time they in harrisburg illinois they had a 3D, um, a 3D like uh, marathon. Uh, it was 
some movie, it was like Raiders of the Lost Ark, but from Wish, you know, cheap as shit. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, showing 3D, you know, like poles coming through, you know, just crap like that. And then yeah. there was one called uh, Space Hunter or something that has Molly Ringwald in it. It was a 3D movie. And then it was Amityville 3D, Jaws 3D, and Friday the 13th 3D. All five in one night. And, and I was so excited about it. And when we got there, um, in, in my hometown, in my grandma's hometown, if they, if a parent bought your ticket, then you could go in or in my hometown, if your parents wrote a note for you, you could walk in and, and watch an R rated movie. But for this thing, you had to have an adult with you hmm. and we were headed to the car. My grandma could tell that I was so upset and she took me back inside bought two tickets and watched those five movies with me. My grandma hates horror movies, but <laughs> she loved me enough. She knew that, that I'd be disappointed if I didn't get to go. She slept through half of it, but no oh. problem. You know, but uh, yeah, my, my grandma was really cool. What was the question that I answered? I'm sorry. I forgot. Um, shit. Now I just fucking forgot. <laughs> All right, man. I get and uh, what would you say? Do you did you prefer MAW over IWA back in the day? Uh, the thing about me, man, I didn't care where I was. I had a, I, I'm like a, a jack off in the locker room. I have a good time you no matter jump? where I go. Yeah. I could count on my ten fingers places that I didn't enjoy going more than places that I did enjoy going. Hell yeah. Uh, I, I didn't care whether it was, I don't know. But so to determine the two, I can't determine the two because mm -hmm. I was I was loved in at IWA Mid South. I was hated by the fans. I'm sorry, hated by the fans at MRW, and uh, you know, I just uh, traveled. You know, that was the thing though. A lot of those guys at IWA Mid South stayed at IWA Mid-South and mm -hmm. uh, I was smarter than that. I knew that if you don't get your face shown in other places uh, your career is just going to fizzle out and die. So man I was going all over the place but uh, oh, yeah. the two main like you just said, the two main back in the day was IWA Mid-South and, and Midwest Renegade Wrestling. And then CZW just came out and kind of just exploded, didn't it? Um, CZW, uh, so the first match that me and Ian, God, I hate saying that motherfucker. The Scissors Incident? But um, the Scissors Incident, yeah. So, I covered it on my channel, man. Great match. Yeah. We knew that we wanted to have jobs at CZW. So... Uh, hat guy from ECW, you know who Hat Guy is? I've heard of him. Well, he wasn't a wrestler, he was a fan, and he was always camera view and always uh -huh. called this stink. Okay, I always had a Hawaiian shirt on, yes, yes, yeah. And um, he was at CZW this night, huh. and uh, I was talking with couple of the guys and they said listen if you want to have a job here at czw you make hack guy uh, impressed to where he goes over to john zandig and says oh my god i can't believe what i just saw well the minute they told us me and that piece of shit started brain storming and uh finally we came up with it and i made the announcement i said does anybody have a pair of scissors that I can borrow to take out in my match? And that Lord Everett brought me a pair of scissors. Uh, I don't know if you know who Lord Everett is, but he was he was okay. on those CZW shows. Well, what we didn't know was he took them straight out of the package. So they were razor fucking sharp. So, uh, yeah, when we got to cutting each other with those scissors, so I put the piece of shit's head right in front of hat guy 
and ran those scissors from temple to temple yeah, and sliced him so a big. Nice fucking pussy on his forehead. That, <laughs> that, that, uh, hat guy was about to puke. And then uh, I got down in the floor and he did my arm and shit like that. Oh, so yeah. uh, they didn't like he, they didn't like Ian. They didn't want Ian. But I got a job at CZW after that. Fuck so. yeah. How many stitches did you need from that? I got, uh, I think I got nine, but he got 24 across. Dude, I got nine was... in my arm. No, I got 11. I got 11 and he got 24 across his four. Insane gash, dude. Of course, uh, the cops got called when we both showed up at the hospital and needed that many stitches from, from that many cuts. But, uh, you know, the cops showed up and we told them what we was doing and they said, well, it's not illegal, but it is fucking stupid. And we said, yeah, we know. <laughs> yeah. And I also have, uh, I covered on my channel in 2001, you had a match with the Sandman in IWA Mid-South. He seemed pretty yeah. fucking wasted during that match, right? No. I mean, uh, uh, yes. Okay. For the first I, one. And then you had I the IWA match a month later. I have wrestled Sandman so many times. I wrestled Sandman drunk. And then I wrestled him uh, during his WCW times when he had to stay sober. Hmm. I will take drunk Sandman over sober <laughs> Sandman any day. Really? I, I can't explain it, but he um, he is more on his game drunk. Really? Yeah, than he oh. ever was sober, yeah. Wow, because I remember hearing stories in ECW of people saying, oh, don't let him swing that fucking stick at me while he's drunk and blah, 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 but... Shit. Well, see, that was always the crazy thing, man. Like, the wilder that he got with that stick with me, um, the more people talked. The more the yeah. the the name got out there of, oh, man, Man Man Pondo was getting hit ruthlessly. Oh, Man yeah. Man Pondo, who's that? You know, so it was always an advertisement. Awesome. Now, um, the one thing on that match that uh, they that you might not know, and a lot of people might not know, so I'll give you the exclusive right here. Oh, he yeah. told me, he told me when we got out there, to uh, when when it was time for me to come back on him, to grab something from the crowd and hit him with it. Brown pin? Huh? No. Um, I hit him with the light tubes. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say. Okay. What did you think about the light he tubes? didn't. He didn't mean light tubes. <laughs> <laughs> he was not very happy that I hit it with light tubes. Dude, but, you uh, kind of had to. Everyone in the crowd had a light tube that night. As soon as you guys walked over there, they're all trying to hand them to you. <laughs> well, he really yeah. didn't. He really didn't look out in the crowd before he told me that. Yeah. So when he <laughs> said, "Grab something and hit me with it," while we're out there, that's what I grabbed. And then later on, he was like, "Dude, you hit me with light tubes," <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah." And he said, why did you do that? I said, you told me to grab something. He goes, you know what? You're right. My fault. Huh? That's interesting because you guys had your I quit match a month later at uh, April blood showers. And he seemed, he went through, you guys did the double, you, you did a suplex off the top rope through a bunch of light tubes. He seemed to be yeah. cool with that. Well, by then, yes. Because okay. I mean, that my swing was the very first time he had ever been hit with light tubes in his life. I bet. I was going to ask then, that. But then later on, you know, it just came uh, kind of normal, those light tubes. So I, I kind of taught Sandman the whole light tube thing. So that's kind of cool, huh? And speaking of 2001, this was around when Nate Webb started to get involved with IWA Mid-South. I'm actually wearing my Spider Nate Webb shirt. That I picked oh, up cool. at Nick Cage Invitational just because I was on here with you. I was like, I'm going to throw that on. How did you guys end up meeting? Um, we both worked for the bloodymidgets.com. Hmm. We were on the road with the midgets constantly. And hmm. it was great money. Really? I mean, it was great money. But the problem is it was like babysitting adults because hmm. they would get drunk and hit on chicks or start fights. And then when, when guys were wanting to fight these guys, they was like, uh, you can't fight me. You got to fight my big guy. And I'm the big guy. I'm not a fighter. So after a while, I was just like, you know what? 
this, this, I've had enough of this shit. But uh, it was really good money and really good fun at the time. So I met Nate Webb there, and then um, he wanted in IWA Mid South. So I told him I would see what I couldn't do. And that was when me and uh, Mitch Page was the uh, MMPs, me and Mitch yeah. Page, and Man Pondo. So when we broke up, I told Ian, I said, let me grab this little skinny guy and call him my new best friend. So that's what they would announce him as, my new best friend, Nate Webb. Because you're jealous, because Nate Webb is my new best friend. <laughs> didn't really care for Nate Webb all that much, but loved Nate Webb's girlfriend. Really? So, yeah. <laughs> I even made her a character on the show and all types of shit. But um, it worked out because, uh, dude, you saw those matches. Like, mm -hmm. I was bossing Nate around. You know, he, he was, he was, I was not treating him like a best friend, but yeah. he was doing everything that I was saying because. We were the new best friends, and it, it it was a hell of a angle, and it worked great. I thought you guys had an awesome match at Blood Feast 2001, where you guys teamed up. And uh, is it? Do you have any memories from that show, or any good stories? What What did I do? What 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 Which? Because I wrestled Nate so much. It was you and Nate Webb versus Too Tough Tony and Mean Mitch Page. I'm pretty sure it was. And Nate Webb did a front flip off the balcony. Too Tough Tony did his spinning. Um, his spinning splash with light tubes duct tape to him. It was pretty much just a light tube fest. You, uh, you guys did a huge pile of chairs outside the ring with a log cabin on top of it. You got thrown into it. It was a good match, man. I covered it on my channel, so that's why I was asking. Right. This is what I was trying to explain to you a minute ago. I have been to so many professional wrestling matches growing up. I went to Super – I was at Super Clash 3. I remember that there was a Kerry Von Erich versus Jerry the King Lawler. I can't remember the rest of the card. Mm -hmm. I went to uh, the very first night of the Skywalkers in Chicago. Can't remember the rest of the card. Man, it's just, gotcha. it's either, it's, I've seen so much that it's all jumbled in there, or I've had my brains beat out for so long that I can't remember nothing. The match that you just explained, I don't even remember. And I hate that. I hate that I can't remember. Some it's all good, bro. You're good, yeah. but I think you'll remember this one. You and Nate Webb at King of the Deathmatch 2002 when he jumped off the wall. I also yeah. did a video on that one. Was that his idea to do that? Of course. There's no yeah. way I could have said, hey, jump up <laughs> there like that. And uh, I thought he was going to stop at the second tier. Really? But this fool climbed up even yeah. up more to the third tier. Now, this is yep. the one where I had a red SpongeBob shirt on. Next yeah. time you watch the video, um, the bottom table was a long table. Mm -hmm. The deep ass piece of shit bought smaller tables. Yes, right? he did. So the bottom mm -hmm. one was a long one. The top one was a small one. So my neck was right underneath, was right above where the the uh, bar for the uh, for the legs went. Mm -hmm. So next time you watch that video, when Nate jumped off that thing and, and hit me on that table, that leg come up through the back of my neck and damn near it knocked me out for a second. Like oh, I'm laying shit. there and, and when I woke up, I was like, oh yeah, I'm wrestling. And I yeah. did get up and I walked to the back, but uh, a lot of people don't know that. But um, yeah, man, I, I, I got a little messed up, but I, I still... Very next day, came back and wrestled again because I'm stupid. But um, yeah, and you were cool with doing it again the next year at 2003. You guys did it for the opening match. I'm sorry, what I said, and you guys also did it again in 2003 for the opening yeah. match. And I think that was the one that had. A, I think that was the one he did a god awful long entry. Yes. Uh, with yes. I mean, what what was it? Three songs. And Dude, then um, I teabagged my balloons, teenage dirt bag, and I'm not sure what I, I think that was it, but it was about an eight or two ten songs, minutes. two full songs. And I remember I uh, teabagged Becky Bayless at the yes. end of it. Yeah. <laughs> yep, I pointed that out in my video, bro. That was a fucking awesome match, dude. 
And I, I was looking up, um, I seen that you were saying that at a lot of the deathmatch tournaments that they have all the fans' weapons and that a lot of the wrestlers like to go and call dibs on the weapons like before the show and that you yeah. said you'd like to show up early because of that. Have you ever yes. seen anyone like get in an argument over a weapon or anything like that? Not so much of an argument, but um, so here's here's the deal. Uh, I was in Japan with Masada when he uh, came up with the skewers. Mm-hmm. Um, me and him would go out to eat with Seizawa, the guy who uh, designs all the deathmatch workers t-shirts. Mm-hmm. And um, the, his friends would take toothpicks and stick them in their foreheads, but then light them on fire, right? And, uh, you know, just something just to impress yeah. us and get like that and have a good time. Well, then Masada would go to the yen shops over there, which is our dollar trees, our dollar, yeah. you know, over there. So uh, they had the package of skewers. Now, in Japan, you can imagine they had thousands of skewers over oh, yeah. there. So um, he came up with that idea. So it wasn't really a fight, but I would see on shows that Masada wasn't on, I would go over and I would snatch um, skewers away from people. And they would say, what are you doing? And I'm like, no Masada, no skewers. You know, I mean, that's his deal. Um because the uh, the light the light tube log cabin, right? Yeah. That was my shit. Legit. I was the first one to go through a light tube log cabin. Hmm. My idea, my deal. And uh, I when I went that. when when I went to Japan, I was the first one to take a light tube log cabin from Katamira, and it made it in the Japanese newspaper over there. Huh. So I considered the light tube log cabin my shit, but you can see now them things just went everywhere, you know, and I lost it. I lost focus on that being mine. Um, uh, New Jack and CZW used to argue about who was the first one to do the staple gun back in 96 for a company in Indianapolis called PWI, not the magazine, a, a company. Mm-hmm. I was, I was, I would uh, do a promo where I'd get all excited and then I'd staple myself and calm myself down. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was doing the staple gun first. Um, mm-hmm. I, I let PG 13 staple gun uh, shit to my forehead before yeah. CZW and before, you know, so, uh, I sit back and watch a lot of shit disappear from me. So I'd be damned if I was going to let anybody take that away from Masada. But uh, I was getting in a lot of fights, not fights, but arguments because people couldn't understand why I would do that. Well, now uh, uh, Masada gave it away to Atticus Kogar. I don't know if he gave it away or if he loaned it to him or what, but... uh, I so, that. so I, I told Atticus because we wrestled each other. I said, "Look, if uh, Masada is, is going to give you his thing, I'll tell you what I do. I'm going to take the record of skewers. So I didn't take just one bundle. I think I took ten or eleven bundles, and I had like a mohawk of the skewers, you know, and." Uh, yeah. I went ahead and put Atticus over just where people realize, okay, it's not Masada's anymore. It's Atticus's now. So um, I just, and then if I see somebody with a saw bat, I'm the first one to go, yo, what the fuck are you doing? You know, (laughs) or if somebody uh, puts a cinder block on somebody's balls and hits it with a sledgehammer, I'm on them. I'm like, damn it. I'm 52. Can you give me something that, that, you know, I, I can't, jump off of balconies anymore so yeah. please let me just have something you know i mean I, i'm very verbal about it now if yeah. not if not in person uh on on the web you know I'll, I'll i'll call somebody out i'm like dude i'm 52 can you leave my shit alone 
Well, just like the stop sign, I mean, any time I see a stop sign in a match, my first thought is Madman Pondo. Yes. Here's the thing about that, though. Um, that's another thing that got away from me. And stop signs are so accessible that there's no way that I can stop everybody from using a stop sign. Yeah. Um, you know, you can get them on every block. Every deathmatch company has one laying around. But um, so stop sign. Thank you for saying that you associate that with me. But there's oh, yeah. so many other guys out there who use the stop signs that, you know, it would just be a fight everywhere I went. So, yeah, I, I was going to ask that about people using uh, stop signs. So it was good that he interjected that. Well, and, and that and like Jimmy Chondo, they call him Chondo because he was a Pondo fan. Huh. Jimmy Lauren out, out of uh, H2O. So his stop sign now says can't stop Pondo. So, you know, at least somebody. Uh, At least he's doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know? mm -hmm. And speaking of fans' weapons, I'm sure you're already ready for this question. The pencil incident is a big video on my channel. People people love it, man. The pencil incident, dude. So you ended up getting graphite poisoning from that shit. How how do you even end up like realizing you had it? Like what symptoms did you have? On the way home. So uh so let me back up a second. Um, the pencil idea, I'm, I'm a people watcher. You can ask any wrestler. I sit back and I watch people. And I watched, so CZW, that show was outside of a, a motorcycle track. Really? And, I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. Uh, you know, the, uh, the dirt bike tracks, dirt bike yeah. tracks. And... So fans brought weapons and they were just laying back there like it was a fucking apocalyptic war or some shit, right? <laughs> so I was watching guys go around and say, oh, yeah, I'll do this with this. I'll do this with this. But everybody would see this pencil board, bed of pencils, and go, oh, no, I'm not fucking with that. I'm not fucking with that. And then the reason that I decided to do the pencil board was brain damage and necro was going over their match. Mm -hmm. And necro is probably uh, not probably necro is the bravest death match guy that I fucking know. Um, and when he looked over at that board and said, no, nah, we're not fucking with that. I'm like, Oh my God, that that's what I can do to be remembered in this tournament right there. So yeah. I went over and I, I went over and I grabbed it and uh, me and Toby went over what we was going to do with it. And I took the bump on it. Um, uh, CZW always had uh, uh, a medical center, not a medical center, a medical tent, you know, mm -hmm. some yeah. people to, to take care of you backstage. So I went back there. Um, they pulled a, a bunch out of my back. Uh, there was a piece in my ass that they couldn't get out. Uh, so, so on the way home, uh, if you remember, uh, Gypsy Joe was the referee, referee yeah. of the main event. Okay, three things people remember about that tournament. They remember that Necro won it. Yeah. They remember that Nick, Nick Gage caught on fire. Oh. And they remember that motherfucking Madman Pondo landed on pencils, right? Uh, yeah, well. So, so uh, on my way home, I got Gypsy Joe in the back seat. I got my Asian wife sitting in the passenger seat. And I start feeling god awful sick. Like uh, I keep turning on the, the air. And uh, Gypsy Joe, he's he's an older guy, so he's cold. Um, uh, my Asian wife sitting up front, so she's getting cold. And I'm, I'm sweating, I'm hot, you know, and I can't figure out what's going on. And, uh, I'm, I'm feeling very sick. So then the next day we had, I'm a big Yankee fan, big mm. Yankee. Fan. Awesome. And, uh, so I drove from that, that tournament of death to Charleston, West Virginia. And then the next day, me, the Asian wife and one of my friends, Frank had tickets for Indians versus the Yankees. All right. So uh, 
I the next day I drove to Cleveland um, to watch the Yankees. Sat in their comfortable seats. That was that was sarcasm. They're not comfortable at all. Uh, drove home, but on the way home from that is when I really started feeling fucking terrible. So by the time I woke up the next morning, it was another five days of of just fucking agony on my whole body. You know, uh, I kept telling my wife that I don't want to get out of bed, and she would be like, "No, we got to go do this. We got to go do this," because she didn't drive. And, and at the uh, time, did you think this was like, did you even have this in your head at all? Like that this could be a lead poisoning thing at all? Or were you just like, I don't know what the fuck is going on with my body? I don't know what the fuck is going on with my body. <laughs> but I was uh, I was uh, highly against the hospital. Yeah. Right. And uh, this is I didn't have any insurance. I didn't have money. Um, the Asian wife got bit by a spider and her her uh neck um really? you know it went down but uh we still had to take her to the hospital so we already had bills yeah. for that um so i did not want to go to the fucking hospital but uh after day five after day five i'm like you know what i i think maybe i'm dying i cool. think I, I think i'm laying in bed and my body is telling me to tell people goodbye. That's how bad I felt. Damn, bro. So uh, I finally did get out of bed that day. And I reached behind me. And I could click my fingernail on the big piece that was in my ass. Right? <laughs> so uh, I took two fingers. And I pushed on each side of it. And that piece sl slid out like a, uh, like a zit. So, so, uh, she looked and she grabbed a couple more pieces. We had them in a plastic bag for a long time. So, she, so, so but as soon as I got that piece, those few pieces out, I started feeling better. And I was like, really? okay, then I, then I know what it is. It was, it was the fucking graphite and the pencils that. And that these are just the little out. tips, like the little sharp tips. This isn't even a big piece, right? These are just the tips of the pencil. I still have them to this day. I still have uh graphite on my back to this day that i can show you when i see you in person Hell so yeah, um, so uh i got that piece out and started feeling better um so since then two wrestlers who are fans of mine um neil diamond cutter and and jimmy loin uh i caught word that they was going to do the pencil board spot I heard about it. Yeah, the minute that I heard that they was going to do that, I called both of those guys and I said, listen, I get it. I get you want to recreate that bump. Don't do it. It's yeah. it's uh, it's not it's not just a death match bump. It is fucking death. It is five, six days of death, yeah. um, you know, and and uh, I stopped them from doing it just because. They're my friends, and that shit was terrible. God, it was terrible. I'll never forget those days. You're a good man for that, Pondo. Well, I I, I guess so, yeah. Another big historic moment that I've covered on my YouTube channel that I was dying to ask you about was your House of Pain death match with Necro Butcher back in IWA in 2002. Um, no. no, I went to the – I mean, yes, it was terrible. I don't yeah. see, I, I don't know on your video if you can hear me or not, but the minute I saw his arm, I stopped the match and started yelling for somebody to get an ambulance. I don't know if that's on your video or not. Fucking ambulance! 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 Now, now, now! I'm pretty sure I did. And uh, so I knew, okay, there's, there's some wrong shit going on here. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I went to the hospital, uh, sat there with Necro, uh, not not with Necro. I was in the waiting room. Necro was gone, and then uh, we had an apartment together at that time. Really? And, uh, yeah. Uh, and I'm I'm sitting around the house, and I'm I'm all sad, and I'm all fucked up. And Necro finally comes over to me, and he goes, "Pondo, what move 
did we do for that to, to happen to my arm? I said, a suplex off the, off the second rope. He goes, where was your arm? And I said, it was behind your neck. And he goes, do you realize if my arm wasn't behind your neck, that piece of glass would have went up through your neck and you wouldn't be here today. Bro. Stop fucking sitting around beating yourself up, you know? And I was like, oh, you know what? Yeah, you're right, you know? So, uh, so yeah, Necro is very uh, intelligent when it comes to shit like that. I can't even imagine what the backlash would have been like if that did happen and one of you guys were to pass or something from a death match. Like, I'm sure we wouldn't even have the scene that we have today, and that probably would have shut a bunch of shit down, you know? Yeah. And um, another question, uh, I, I covered your circus death match with J.C. Bailey. I actually covered both of them, but the one with Ito and Bailey. But I wanted to ask you about that. Did you ask Matsunaga for permission to do that or anything before, or...? You just figured nah, out was cool with it. I, I was just a big fan of Masanaga and um they did they did one excuse me with a bal oh not a balcony but whatever it was in the middle of the ring mm -hmm. and me and JC Bailey got together and we said we wanna do that, but what can we do different? And that's when we came up with the three tiers of uh a balcony you know we already yeah. knew that uh i was taking the i was what we was going to do on the bottom we knew what we were going to do from the top we didn't know what we was going to do from the middle and mm -hmm. that was going to be a uh an stf off the middle really where huh? we, yeah where we both landed at the same time but we didn't determine the space in between uh, if you watch the video again, you'll see us and yeah, we're like, oh, yeah. yeah, so that's why it became a Russian leg sweep off there. Yeah. And thank God we did do a Russian leg sweep because something else you might not have noticed, the board was not attached yeah. and it came down with us. So mm -hmm. there's no telling what would have happened if we did a, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so, so yeah, you know, shit happens. Something that I always wanted to ask you. Let me also say this, and uh, this, I'm glad you brought that up because um, people out there now watch, well, not not deathmatch fans, but regular wrestling fans will watch that match and talk about how stupid it is and and uh, was it worth the hot dog and the handshake that we got. Well, here's the thing about that. You can make fun of me all you want. You can ridicule me. I, I'm I'm strong man i got thick skin i don't care about that jc bailey is not with us no more shut the fuck up about that match and and uh you know let us be proud let jc from wherever he is right now be proud of what we did and stop bitching about it if you don't like it turn the channel you know exactly. that on another channel for all i care mm -hmm. i didn't mean to interrupt you though but go ahead no no you're good bro but I, I, I always wondered this. It, it seemed like you guys did the almost the exact same moves when you had the match with Ito, like the same moves from the J.C. Bailey one. Was that just a coincidence that you guys ended up doing a suplex off the top, or was that just because you already had done that before or anything? Or Yeah, it's because I'd already done it. And uh, okay. there, there was really no other moves that I could think of to do. But um, here, here's the deal. The one in America was all one piece, right? Mm -hmm. It was all one piece this way, and then it was all one piece this way. So there was no way me and JC was going through the middle of that. Yeah. Uh, I didn't watch how Japan set theirs up, and I should have, because they cut each piece. Huh. So it was a whole bunch of pieces, plus it was on the second rope. Yeah, yeah, it was. So that, so that final bump, uh, you guys hit the fucking canvas. <laughs> yeah, man, and and knocked the wind out of me, and uh, yeah, that the, the the me and JC was way better than the one me and Ito. I was just about to ask you which one did you prefer out of those. And um, I I also covered um, your 200 light twos match with Zandig, Wife Beater, and Jun Kasai. 
It was an awesome match. It, I think it was one of the first 200 light tube matches. Right. Um, now, nah, they was doing them in, uh, in, uh, next to a volleyball uh, place there in, uh, in New Jersey, I think. CZW was. But, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're talking about uh yokohama bunker gym yes it was their huge show uh terry funk was, was there i think it was called um, huh i think it was called anti up like a-n-t-e up i'm pretty I sure remember. i don't uh, remember but uh terry funk was there mil mascaris was there oh really uh, yeah van hammer was supposed to be there but um no showed for some reason but uh yeah, I don't remember a lot about that. I got you. It's all good, man. Another one that is a classic, dude, that I would, I, I've been dying to hear your side of the story. The grandfather clock incident with Mitch Page, bro. The grandfather clock was supposed to be me. Really? I was the one, yeah, I was supposed to be the one to get hit with the grandfather clock. Uh, back in the Kmart building, Another piece of shit named Ox Harley threw me in a vat of rubbing alcohol. And when he did that, wasn't his fault. It was my fault. Uh, a whole bunch of it went down my throat. A whole bunch of rubbing alcohol went down my throat. So uh, when I got to the back, my skin, my my whole body was completely white. And they was getting ready to take me to the to the hospital. I went outside, I, I hurled and hurled and fucking puked until I couldn't puke no more. And when I came back in, my color came back. So I was pretty fucked up over rubbing alcohol. Yeah. Uh, it was to the point that if I was in a locker room and somebody started cleaning their body off with rubbing alcohol, it would, it would start my gag reflex right away. I'd have to get away from those people. So... That match that me and Mitch Page had, we used light tubes, or somebody used light tubes before mm -hmm. with light tubes filled with rubbing alcohol. So um, I, I, I don't know if it was already on the mat or if it was in the light tubes, but it started to rain during that match. Mm -hmm. and, and the minute, it, and we was outside, the yeah. minute it started to rain, that smell came up and i started smelling it. and i went over i said mitch we got to go home right now i'm getting ready to puke we got to go home right now mitch said use the grandfather clock so i did yeah right? i used the grandfather clock and then it was so odd i saw something like hanging from from the side of mitch's face from from the side of his head I'm like, what the fuck is that? And then when I got close enough, it was his ear. And he's getting ready to grab it. And I grab him by the wrist. And I say, no, don't touch that. Don't fucking touch that. And again, I start yelling for an ambulance, you know. Yeah. So I mean, I, I'm, I'm the most dangerous guy in fucking IWA Mid-South right now that I can't stop hurting my friends. Uh, <laughs> so I did go to the hospital with Mitch as well. And the ambulance that he was in, they had, they, they pulled over a grate and they had a large squeezy, squeegee, and they was squeegeeing the blood out of the floor of that, of that ambulance. So I knew it was bad. And uh, Holy uh, shit. to this day, I so apologize. Uh, he's not really a fan of mine anymore, but um, mm -hmm. I, I will say this. But uh, I miss Mitch Page more than he will ever know. He was one of the funniest guys I ever met in the world. But uh, uh, maybe someday we'll we'll uh, get together and talk again. Who knows? Hell yeah, man. But um, I also saw – so one of my favorite deathmatch tournaments ever is King of the Death Matches 2003, which you won. How happy were you to finally take home the trophy from that tournament? You know, it's – it's funny. I don't even think I got a trophy. Really? Why? Did I hold one? Did I hold one up at the end of the match? I, I'm trying to remember. You were in the cage match. You guys used the weed whacker. I know everyone came and celebrated in the ring after, but they were having the whole IWA and CZW angle. So I'm not sure if they really came out and celebrated or if they tried to play off the angle at the end. Yeah, I don't. I don't. 
think I got a trophy. If I did, it it disappeared somewhere. But uh, um, I remember the first night. Um, then I wrestle Axel the first time. It was you and Nate Webb in night one where he redid the wall jump. And then yeah, that was Nicky again. Bayless uh, tea bagger, right? Mm-hmm. And then it was either Balls Mahoney or Axel in the quarterfinals, Nick Gage in the semifinals. Axel. Yeah, Axel. And you, you did the balcony dive with Nick Gage uh, off the spider's nest in the semifinals. And then uh, I remember Nick Gage, we went up to uh, the announcer's booth. And we had tables and light tubes. And Nick Gage took a bump where he hit both tables and more or less uh, my whole lower body hit the fucking Dude, concrete. You went straight right? to the floor. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. How the I, remember fuck that. Did you, I don't know how you did that, bro. And then you still went on to wrestle in the finals too, bro. Like that was fucking crazy, man. Retardation hasn't helped anybody else out in life more than it has me, man. And was that your first time using a weed whacker in the finals when you used it on Bailey? Uh, did did he use it on me too? I can't remember. But um, pretty sure you only used it on him. You put the light light tubes over his nuts and you hit him in the nuts with it. I'm pretty sure it was. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, uh, really, that that finish. I am surprised that 2003 is a lot of people's favorite death match because that finish was such bullshit that I. Electrocuted the cage, <laughs> dude. That was now, but um, it shocked yeah. Bailey and makes him do a front flip. Yeah, <laughs> after, after a while, after a while, uh, two nights of death matches with twenty four guys, dude. you run out of ideas. So that was that was the best thing that we could come up with. Yeah, yeah. you made it work though, bro. I gotta say, I'm so full of shit. I could go all night long. Fuck yeah, bro. And you went up against Bailey. You guys did a rematch from the finals in 2004, King of the Death matches, where you guys did a giant fucking a huge thing of chairs, and you guys went off the bleachers into it. Yeah. And uh, 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 I remember that. Uh, the, the the thing that people talked to me about with that, um, again, I went early. So I could pick and choose my weapons, and I found uh, Castle Gray Skull. Mm. Do you remember? Uh, I got on the top rope and and said, uh, "He man's a uh, famous sentence." I can't even remember what that I don't is. Know what it is? I was never a He Man fan, but I know what you're talking Me about. Me neither. Me <laughs> neither. I saw that. Gray Skull. When I saw that uh, castle, I was like, oh, this will get the crowd going. And that's exactly what it did, you know. I, thank mm -hmm. God the crowd watched He-Man more than me because I had to ask somebody, I think, what what his uh, catchphrase was before he turned into He-Man. Huh? Is, is it, I got the power? By the, by the, by the, by the power of grace. Oh, yeah, yeah. I knew it then. Thank God I knew it then. And around then was uh, the backyard wrestling video game, bro. How did that feel to finally become a, uh, in a wrestling game? Uh, such a big honor to this day, man. Um, one of the gathering of the Juggalos, I had no idea who Kevin Gill was. And uh, you hear a lot of bullshit in professional wrestling. A lot of guys mm -hmm. say, uh, hey, this is going to happen someday and shit doesn't happen. And uh, Kevin Gill um, asked me if he could talk to me. I said yes. And uh, he started buying drinks. I don't drink alcohol, but, uh, you know, I figured, hey, this guy wants to buy me something. So I, I think I was buying screwdrivers at the time, mm -hmm. more orange juice than vodka. And uh, he finally told me, he's like, I'm here to talk to ICP because I want to put you guys in a video game. I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be great, you know. Like, uh, I, I didn't believe it, yeah, yeah. you know. And then, and then the shit started coming true. And then uh, yeah, Kevin yeah. Gill is the creator of the Backyard Wrestling game. Oh. Um, in, oh. part, in, in, the, um, in part one, the uh, fucking announcer, you know, the guy interviewing everybody, 
You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. You know, I know what you're talking about in the game. That's Kevin Gill. Really? That's Kevin Gill doing it. Yeah, he's uh, always been so behind the scenes. I never really knew much about him until the last few years, Kevin. Yeah. And then he, um, part two, same thing. He's, uh, I'm pretty sure he's in that game as well. And, yeah. uh, you know, you can create wrestlers in both of those games, but I am so proud and humbled to be uh, an original character in those video games. Oh, and, yeah. then, and then later on, uh, me, Necro, and Too Tough Tony made it in the Firestarter Returns game. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not really our names, yeah. Because they don't want to pay us. But uh, I was Murderer Londo, <laughs> and uh, uh, Four Rough Dory, I think, was was Too Tough Tony. Funny story about that. About the the video game, for for a year, uh, Tony had like this this he was bald up here but had one piece of hair in the uh, a big strand of hair in the front and i kept telling him how dumb that looks you got to shave that shit mm -hmm. and he kept saying no nah, man i don't have much hair left i'm gonna keep it and then uh we started playing the video game and his character has a brown triangle right here from that piece of hair <laughs> he, stopped, he stopped playing and went and shaved it right then he's like you was right <laughs> no way <laughs> Hell yeah. And you also won Brink of Death 2007. Brink of Death. For BCW. Oh, for Vipers. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people don't even remember that I won that. But um, these two guys, the Day Brothers, their grandma. David Day and uh, I'm not sure the other. Uh, David and Sean. Sean Day, I can't remember either. I, I I'm such a terrible friend. It's but um, but uh, their grandma. I don't know if you ever saw the video. They would sick me on their grandma. Like I was a big time heel, and uh, Hell yeah. uh, she was uh, she was in her eight seventy seventy eight or in her eighties or something I like that. I think that might actually be on YouTube. I'm pretty sure it is. It yeah. is. I have a. I have a baseball bat with a fake hand on the end of it. And I was like grabbing her crotch and her ass with it and okay. telling her that's the best she's had in a while and shit like that. I mean, but the day brothers would love it. They would, they would, uh, they would tell me go after my grandma. So. Oh, yeah. And uh, speaking of how you said you don't drink earlier, what was it like in the locker rooms of like IWA and CZW back then? Was there a shitload of drugs going around? Like how they say the ECW was back in the day, or was it a little bit more tame and just chill? It was a little more tame because yeah. uh, we was in a Kmart building and AKA bingo hall. So they had eyes on us all the time, making sure that, you know, we wasn't fucking around and stuff like that. Of course, uh, Tommy Rich would would always have a good old case of beer, you know, good old case of beer. But um, uh, another company that I would go to in Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee, was called Kick Ass Wrestling, and anything goes in that company. They had they had strippers. They were sponsored by strippers, so strippers would like uh, just reach in your shorts and fucking grab your dick and tell you hello and. Uh, there was, I didn't do them, but there was alcohol, there was drugs everywhere, you know. That was probably one of the funnest companies that I ever went to. Huh. And you also won Double Def 2006 with Too Tough Tony. Did you, what, were, did you guys propose the idea of having a tag team deathmatch tournament? Like, how did that come about? And uh, did you think it would ever work? Like, did you think that would uh, pop with the fans? or? We, we was... Uh, doing a lot of japan at that time mm -hmm. um the date set for that for that show was to make sure we wouldn't be in japan huh. i do remember that that they had to they had to schedule the show to make sure that we wasn't in japan and because we was bakugajin in japan um piece of shit wanted us to uh team in that double death match tournament. And yeah. uh, um, I, like I said, I don't remember a lot, but I do remember 
Darren Childs uh, caught his sweater on fire and then yep. couldn't, couldn't get it unzipped. Yep. And uh, uh, I think it was Too Tough Tony who went over and and pulled it off his body or mm -hmm. we might not have a Darren Childs today. Exactly, bro. I covered that on my channel. That's a big video too. Uh, other than that, I don't remember a fucking thing, man. Did you like I don't know how we won? I don't know shit. Do what? Did, did you like taking any fire bumps or were, were you into that or no? Fire is very unpredictable. Oh, yeah. And um, you're not going to see it that well. But uh, from here to here, uh, anyway, um, at CZW, uh, me, Nate Hatred, and White Peter had a three way. And I'm on the top rope punching Nate Hatred and there's they put a barbed wire table behind me and caught it on fire but it took them maybe 15 seconds to finally powerbomb me so when they did the barbed wire was butter cutting hot like it just sliced my shit right and then uh I had a JCW jersey on which uh kind of kept the heat inside inside my uh shirt for a minute but yeah fire i've done a few fire things but uh i'm not a big fan just because of how unpredictable fire can be it just really is too dangerous to fuck with man you know it, is. it just takes just... takes one guy that's too excited with a, a bottle of lighter fluid puts too much on there and then it soaks in and just it could be a nightmare real quick uh, look at look at Matt Tremont, you know. I mean, uh, just just the Onita match. Matt yeah. Tremont spent some nights in the hospital over that shit. Another question I always wanted to ask you. It, so you you said that you you and the piece of shit aren't cool anymore. But when you made IWA East Coast, what, did, why did you name it IWA East Coast? Like, did, why didn't you change it to something else? Because that's so similar to Mid South. You know what I mean? Like. Were you guys still, like still cool when you made that company? I'm not. I'm not sure how you guys were when you started it. So, uh, we were kosher, and Ian was bringing his ring from uh, from uh, Louisville here to Charleston, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, so, I was very smart. The very first IWA East Coast show. Uh, so. IWA Mid South at that time was fucking hot. Mm -hmm. it was very hot. So yes, I did ask Ian, hey, can I call it IWA East Coast? Okay. He gave me this blessing. So there you go. Huh. Then um the meeting that I had with uh the 108 Dragon Ninjas, there was a whole group of them. Uh, I said, All right, give me some names that you think will draw in this area where I can start contacting people. And they was given this name, this name, this name. And finally they said, I would say Abdul the Butcher, but he no showed two times in this area. I said, Holy shit, guys, that that that's it right there. And they're like, Yeah, but I said he no showed. I said, He's my boy. He's not gonna fucking no show. So main event, Abdul the Butcher. Who should we put him with? And that's when Necro Butcher. So we had Necro Butcher versus Abdul the Butcher, Battle of the Butchers. Yeah. Um then I contacted Tosaka because he was always saying uh, he wanted his uh, Japanese wrestlers to come to America and uh, make some kind of uh, noise over here. So I called, I contacted Tosaka and I said, okay, who can you send me? And he said, Ryuji Ito and Saki, Dasuke Sakimoto um, and Yuki, Yuki the referee. Mm -hmm. So I wrestled uh, Ito in a, a double tables match, and then um, piece of shit wrestled Sakimoto. And then, um, so then I told myself, I want to have a good, solid fucking wrestling match. So that's when I got hold of uh, Chris Hero and Cesaro, but uh, Castaldi at the time. Yeah. Fucking excellent wrestling match, right? Mm -hmm. Then uh, 
I, I wanted to have girls on the show because Ian always brought Mickey. Well, uh, Cesaro was re- was uh, dating, uh, I don't know, Chris Hero. One of them, too. I'm pretty sure it was Chris Hero was dating Allison Danger, uh, mm-hmm. Steve Crino's sister at the time. So there it was, Mickey Knuckles versus Allison Danger. And then I wanted to have um, some kind of WWE name on the show. So uh, Zach Gowan was a good friend of mine. Uh, really? and, yeah, it hadn't been that long since since he had been off WWE. So uh, Nate Webb, your T-shirt right there, was doing El Drunko at the time. And I thought, yeah. you know what? Uh, a comedy drunk character versus a WWE one-legged guy. It's got to be funny, right? And it was. Right. It was hilarious. So that was my six matches. And the very first IWA East Coast show, we drew 250 people. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, I was I, – I, I really thought about uh, um, my whole decisions. And, yes, IWA East Coast, naming it off of IWA Mid-South was one of those ideas. Gotcha. I know this is a very broad question, but do you have a favorite show from IWA East Coast? Uh, probably, you know, it's, it might be, it might be because it's fresh in my mind, but I thought our Masters of Pain 2020 fucking rocked. I, uh, I, I don't know. 2008 also. 2008. Uh, who, who our was Wire it? Trampoline with Thumbtack Jack, Eco. Okay, yeah, that was a good one too because, you know, um, well, here, here's the deal that, that we did with uh, 2020, right? Yeah, 2020s. Um, we always let one of our friends in the tournament, and we always got shit on about it, you know? So this one, I told Fat Ton, uh, who runs IWA's Coast now, I said, we're going to do a tournament. I'm not, you know, I was supposed to be in it. But uh, I got my ribs and and my lung punctured and collapsed lung and all that shit, so I couldn't be in it. But I chose seven guys, seven hot on the death match scene right now. I got I had Akira, uh, Nolan Edward, uh, which which I wish Nolan Edward, if you're listening, would stop letting fucking cancel culture get to you and come back to wrestling, man. You, you fucking, uh, you got, you got treated sideways, come back. So, uh, Akira, I'll just say that the eight Akira, uh, fucking Nolan Edwards, Slack, John Wayne Murdoch, Alex Cologne, uh, shit. See, I get hit in the head way too fucking much. Uh, (laughs) E Raver, G Raver. Uh, anyway, all right. Let, let me just go over the matches. Stacked card, Slack, nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. Slack. Slack versus Shane Mercer, and then it was John Wayne Murdoch versus Akira, and then um, Alex Cologne took on Nolan Edwards, and then G Raver took on Jimmy Lloyd. Right. Oh, yeah. Everybody's favorites was Slack. Jimmy Law, uh, Slack, G Raver, um, because I paid attention on on the fucking on our message board. Slack, G Raver, John Wayne Murdoch, or Alex Cologne. First, first four matches, those guys eliminated. Yeah. Right. Then um, the second was uh, everybody thought Shane Mercer or Jimmy Lloyd eliminated. Boom. And then. Uh, uh, Nolan Edwards took on Akira, two young uh, guys that are trying to make it in the fucking deathmatch world, went out there and destroyed each other. And uh, I think we made the right choice. Uh, I, I was really happy with the Masters of Pain 2020. Awesome. Tw- 2021, sorry, 2021. And uh, we are already starting putting our minds together for masters of pain 2022 so it'll be in the same building and um you know i'm gonna get eight more 
uh, deserving death match guys. And uh, hopefully it'll be just as good this year as it was last year. And where is that going to be again? It's in Campbell's Creek, West Virginia, which is a, a suburb of uh, Charleston, West Virginia. Dude, I we think had, I'm going to have to come there, bro. You know what time you're doing it? Yeah. Uh, probably about the same time in June, second week of June. Gotcha. Uh, we, uh, we had 300 people show up, you know? So, Dude, uh, I would love to come and, like, do a video thing, like, try to shoot some stuff. Like, if you would like to do something with me on YouTube, that would be awesome, man. I would love to do a collaboration at one of your shows. Well, let's just see how it goes. Let's see. Uh, yeah. uh, it is 8.15. Uh, real quick, before uh, we let him go, I do want to tell everybody to check out Memoirs of a Madman. Uh, I know for a fact you can pick it up on Amazon uh, right now. Uh, it's also and you got, pick, and you can pick it up on eatsleepwrestle.com and talk to John Cosper, the writer of the book, about an autographed copy. There you go. Um, is that an autobiography, yeah. Pondo? Yeah. Okay. 348 pages of uh, of me telling embarrassing stories about myself, uh, wrestling stories, Japan stories, 2001 maniac stories. There is a uh, there's a whole Three pages of me fucking with a scammer. There's, um, hell yeah. There's, I was in a comic book, you know. The, get Dude, the book. I'm, I'm I getting a copy of it. All my fans. I have one complaint. I haven't had one complaint about that book. Everybody says they always laughed out loud during the book. Fuck um, yeah. gotta check it another out. thing, uh, my buddy Corey Higdon has made a website for nothing but deathmatch wrestlers to sell their t-shirts on. I was on. getting ready to mention that too. Uh, got the yeah, flyer we'll up. It's deathmatchworldwide.com. Uh, we'll include links. Uh, to oh, market yeah. that. Make sure everybody go and check that out. I was checking out the website earlier. The prices are good. They've, they've got the cheapest hoodies you'll find anywhere on the internet. I guarantee that. So go check them out. Tell them, tell them Pondo sent you. It won't get you nothing any cheaper, but you know, <laughs> at, least, at least he'll uh, buy me a Twinkie or something. Right? I don't know. Maybe a hot dog and handshake or something. You never know. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> All right, guys. It's 821. I got that other one to do. But uh, thank you guys for thank your you time. And if you had more questions, save them. And uh, also ask me those questions. And have your fans ask some questions, oh, yeah. and I'll, we'll get back on here. Uh, I won't schedule another podcast that day. We'll talk for three fucking hours if you want. I don't yeah, care. Dude. It will I do. So we I'm Blake0561, and that's a wrap on this interview, guys. As always, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. I'm Blake0561, motherfucker. I don't give up. Let me know how you guys like the interview and who'd you like to see next. I'm coming back, motherfucker. Get ready. Oh, fuck yeah. If you want to see the book that we were talking about for this video, check out Memoirs of a Madman at EatSleepWrestle.com. Start sending in some questions for round two, and I'll see you in the next video. Later.